Uh, well, uh, good morning, uh, yeah, ex your excellencies, distinguished guests. Um, I'm going to cover mostly uh, solutions and, and how we get to zero carbon. I want to spend just a little bit of time on, on the seriousness of climate change. Let's see if I can get this to advance. All right, hold on. Yeah, something happened, somebody changed something in the last minute or two, so it's now not working. I actually had this one working. Please bear with us. Lost the cursor, too. I don't have a cursor. Oh, here it is. Huh. Yeah, it's frozen. Huh. Okay. Yeah, I think I'll have to do that. And it's probably going to take a password. Somebody have a password to this? No? Okay. I'm just going to try to launch PowerPoint again. Ah, good. Okay, finally. We just relaunched PowerPoint. It seemed to work. Um, I just threw a slide in during the break because somebody asked this question about, hey, what happens when the carbon dioxide level goes up? What happens to the sea level? That's not an easy question to answer, but I, I wanted to take one slide from another presentation I had. This was a study over, I think, the last 15,000 years or so, and it's showing the, the sea level on the y-axis and on the x-axis is showing CO2 in parts per million. You can see there's a clear trend. The higher the CO2, the higher the sea level, okay? Um, and so that's the pre-industrial level, and that was sort of where we started at sort of the, the zero point. This is today's CO2 level, about 410 parts per million. Now, you can't just extract. It looks like a nice group, and you can extrapolate it. You can't do that because you know, the way the ice covers the Earth is different from now than from when it was then. Uh, there were, were a couple papers that indicated the West Antarctic ice sheet may be uh, uh, beyond uh, saving. If that's the case, the West Antarctic ice sheet is probably about four meters of sea level rise. So we might be committed to four meters of sea level rise even at today's temperature. So, but again, there's, there's kind of debate about that. I guess the one thing I wanted to point out, there's a lot of talk about, um, gee, doesn't the climate always change? What's the big deal? You know, it has changed the history of the earth. What I try to emphasize to people is what's really important is that our species Homo sapiens have been around for about 150,000 years. And it's only in the last 10,000 years that civilization developed. And why is that? It's because we came out of the last glacial period, the sea level went way up, we got this very stable temperature. It's really only varied plus or minus about half a degree C for the last 10,000 years. So everything on Earth is adapted to that. And we're already one degree C higher. So that's why we're already seeing these effects, is we've already blown ourselves out of this so-called Goldilocks climate. So one of the things we're seeing, even at the one degree Celsius temperature rise, are weather extremes. It was mentioned before that the Earth is not heated uniformly. The Arctic, due to Arctic amplification, has gotten much, much warmer. So the temperature difference between the North Pole and the, and the equatorial regions has decreased. That just caused the jet stream to slow down and get very loopy. And we're seeing all this crazy weather now, and that's all associated with that. So here's some, you know, East Africa drought, death toll a quarter million people perhaps in 2011. Uh, I grew up in the New York City area, Long Island. There was one day in August a few years ago, 13 inches of rain in 24 hours. 
Long Island is not a rainforest, okay? These are extreme events. Uh, the, the, the fire in, that just occurred recently in California, they now have a control, 85 people dead. So firefighters in California are finding that wildfires are much hotter and moving much faster. California, this not, did not used to be the fire season in California. California had a summer fire season. Now they're having record fires in the winter, November and December. And firefighters used to, their big job was to save expensive homes, right? They had to save those homes. Now their job is to save people. They have, to have 85 people dead in this so-called campfire in Northern California, and there's still 150 people missing from that fire. This is incredible stuff. This has not happened before. Things are different. Uh, Lizard Island, the north end of the Great Barrier Reef, tremendous amount of mortality due to the last global bleaching event. Four Category 4 hurricanes have struck U.S. territory in the last 15 months. Those are the four hurricanes, all Category 4, with tremendous consequences. If you look at Harvey, uh, the amount of rainfall that Harvey received, it was estimated, was, was made three and a half times more likely because of climate change. So now scientists are connecting events to climate change in terms of probabilities. Uh, this is a picture from the Greek fires. Again, uh, fires moving so fast people couldn't escape them. What we're seeing in 2015, 2016, the third world global coral bleaching event, where sea surface temperature gets so high that the corals die and they die permanently. Over a short bleaching event, they can recover. Over longer bleaching events, they can't. So when, when uh, scientists go into the coral record, and they look at ancient corals, they can see bleaching events occur here or there around the world. They don't see these global worldwide bleaching events. This is new stuff. Have any of you seen the, uh, the movie Chasing Coral? I highly recommend it. Uh, if you can get, I, I know, in, is, is Netflix available? Uh, or you see Netflix, right? It's worldwide, I presume, okay? Um, it's on Netflix. I really highly recommend it because they, they followed what happened in the last global bleaching event, particularly in Australia. It's very well documented in that film. These are costs of U.S. billion dollar disaster events. You can see this incredible increase in costs. And if you look, all those colored curves are, are 2004 through 2017. Again, we're, we're seeing that these very expensive events, these, this is something new. This is a 2011 NOAA study, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in, in, in the United States. And this looked at what was happening in the Eastern Mediterranean in terms of extended drought. And basically they, they, they said that human caused climate change is a major factor in more frequent Mediterranean droughts. And of course, this area here, this so there's several Caribbean studies in the journal that have made a clear link between what we've seen and climate change, meaning climate change is one of the factors involved in what we've seen. So you had this extreme drought event from 2005 to 2010. You had about 800,000 people move off their land, their livestock died, they couldn't, they couldn't grow their crops, the cities couldn't handle them, and you get this civil unrest. This particular study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, March 2015, concluded no natural cause is apparent for these trends, whereas the observed drying and warming are consistent with model studies of the response to increases in greenhouse gases. So look, we know what's causing this problem. We know because we've been burning fossil fuels, we've added a lot of the carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. CO2 is an excellent absorber of infrared radiation. It's blocking that outgoing infrared radiation. So the Earth is out of balance. We want the sunlight coming in, balanced by the infrared radiation going out. Right now, there's about a seven-tenths of a watt per square meter of surface area of the Earth, more solar coming in than there is infrared radiation going out. More heat coming in than heat going out. 0.7 watts per square meter doesn't sound like a lot, but the Earth has a big surface area. So if you work it out, the amount of heat that we're putting into the atmosphere with all these greenhouse gases 
is the amount of heat equivalent to about five Hiroshima bombs going off every second. So these are the things that we need to do. We need to look at carbon capture and store. If we're going to keep using fossil fuels, somehow we need to capture the carbon and store it. Uh, nuclear power has done an excellent job of reducing carbon emissions. Efficiency and renewable energy are the ones that I've worked on, and those are the ones I'm going to focus on in this presentation. So if you look at the International Energy Agency and you look at um, their approach to getting to two degrees Celsius, and I, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but if you look in the literature, the first reference to two degrees is a paper, uh, papers in 1975 and 1970 by William Nordhaus. He's a professor of economics, okay, at Yale University. There's not a lot of science that indicates two degrees C is safe. I think we now know two degrees C is not safe. We know that one degree C is not safe. Some of the, uh, basically, coral scientists are, selling, are telling us that up to 90% of the world's coral reefs could be dead by mid-century. And it's estimated that one out of four marine species rely on coral reefs. So what we're doing is we're killing a foundational ecosystem of the entire ocean system. Uh, the, 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 I mean, it's, I, I get frustrated that people don't get that climate change is an emergency. Uh, and I, I, per, personally, I don't think future generations are going to get it. They're not going to understand why we didn't do more. Uh, I will have some good news later, but, but I'll, I'm, I'm going to temper that as well. So getting back to this, if you look at what, uh, what the uh, International Energy Agency says, where we should invest our money, a big thing is efficiency, then renewables, and then nuclear, and then carbon capture and storage. Efficiency is a big piece of the pie. I did a study of uh, reducing carbon emissions in the U.S. back in 2006, 2007. I led a study. Um, and efficiency wound up being 57% of the carbon emissions reductions. So efficiency is a big deal, in particular in buildings. In the buildings uh, uh, part, buildings in the U.S. are responsible for about 45% of U.S. carbon emissions. People don't realize how important buildings are. So I want to spend a little bit of time on that. This is the main office building at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Uh, it's the nation's largest net zero energy office building. And the way we achieved that is we had a very specific design goal that the architect and the, uh, uh, and, the, and the builder had to get together and agree to meet. And that was 80 kilowatts per uh, hours per square meter per year of energy use. Uh, and, and it ultimately cost, uh, came in at a cost that's typical for an office building in the Denver, Colorado area. So these are a bunch of the different things that are used in that building. I don't have time to dwell into all these different things. I just wanted to point out there's a lot of advanced mm -hmm. energy features. To make it net zero, and this is the building here is what we're talking about, it's got almost a megawatt of photovoltaics on the three roofs. That's not enough to make it net zero. We also have to use this PV and this PV. All that on-site photovoltaics means that on an annual basis, there's enough photovoltaic energy produced to equal the amount of energy used by the building every year. So at NRO, we have a lot of experts on these net zero energy buildings. The problem is if you're going to address climate change, you can't do it one building at a time. It takes too long. Again, this is an emergency. And so what we've really done is shifted uh, from all electric, from net zero energy buildings to all electric zero carbon districts. And I, I retired from Mineral at the end of June, so, but I worked there for 40 years, so please forgive me if I still sound like I work there, okay? It's hard to get it out of my system. So these are some of the net zero energy districts around the country that are being worked on. We developed a new, a new computer model called Urban Op that allows you to lay out these districts. It looks at shading on the roof. It looks at moving uh, energy from one building to another, et cetera. Again, I don't have time to go into all those details. Uh, but you'll see three of the neighborhoods are, are uh, districts are right in the Denver area that, that uh, NREL is working on. So a real key here, though, is integrating renewables into the grid. So utilities now have to deal with a variable solar supply, a variable wind supply. Uh, they're used to variable loads. They're not used to variable sources. So that's the focus. 
So how do you achieve this? How do you get lots of renewables out there in a way that you still have a reliable electric grid? Well, for one thing, solar and wind complement each other fairly well. Um, if, if you look, uh, th this is a particular data from, from one state in the United States, uh, but you can see throughout the year, uh, the, uh, the solar uh, 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 tends to uh, go up, of course, in the summertime, uh, and the wind is better in the wintertime. So on an annual basis, they complement each other. And I think most of you will agree, the sun tends to shine more during the day than at night, and the wind blows more at night during the day. That's, again, not everywhere, but it's, it's common. The other thing is spatial diversity. So the, the more access you have to different uh, uh, wind farms, the, the smoother you get uh, for your profile. Uh, so at, at the bottom are just uh, uh, access to 15 wind turbines, uh, and this is showing you the, the variation uh, uh, throughout the year. And then up here, um, excuse me, this is just this is just over an eight-hour period. I said that wrong. Um, this was, is with 200 uh, uh, turbines, um, and, and so you could see as you as you get uh, 215 turbines, as you get more and more turbines, you get a smoother profile. And it's the same thing with solar. So these are different curves. This is the actual solar profile throughout a day, all right. And this one down here is one plant that varies a lot. Uh, but when you get up to 25 plants, you get a curve that follows that pretty smoothly. So spatial diversity is important. You, you need to have independent system operators pull in electricity from different areas. Another thing that's important is good forecasting. Um, and so this shows you, this is a study done by Arizona Public Service, and it shows you the, um, uh, basically the, the cost of integrating electricity into the grid, uh, renewable electricity, in terms of dollars per megawatt hour. Uh, and you can see uh, up to 10% integration here. And you can see this is the, the cost associated with uncertainty in the forecast. So if you drive these uncertainties down, if you have better hour ahead, day ahead forecasting, uh, utilities don't have to bring other plants online and it saves them a lot of money. So forecasting is important. How many of you have seen these so-called duck curves? All right, mo probably most of you. Uh, you can probably see why it's called duck curves, all right, because it looks like the profile of a duck. And this is from the California Independent System Operator. And it basically just shows you the profile throughout the day. And as you add more and more photovoltaics, that helps you in the middle of the day, but it leads to very high ramp rates at the end of the day, and it shifts the peak to later in the day. So you have to have ways to deal with that. Well. Uh, I know many of you work on concentrating solar power, and CSP is one way to deal with that. If we have thermal storage, we can help deliver energy during that, that peak period when electricity is, is very valuable. And so this shows you what would ordinarily happen uh, in, with photovoltaics. Um, as, you, as you get more and more photovoltaics on the grid, in order to, to get those peaky areas, there's times when you need to curtail the PV. So this is a plot that shows you how much uh, PV has to be curtailed. It's the marginal amount, so it's any additional PV you add, what percent of it would have to be curtailed as a function of the solar penetration. So here, without doing anything, just putting PV in, you see you're getting lots of curtailment. And anytime you curtail PV, you're increasing its cost. So there's various things that you can do to add grid flexibility. Uh, you can have demand, uh, demand response from buildings. Uh, you can have uh, better control uh, with your generators. You can have more spatial diversity. Uh, and then you can sort of get to this curve isn't as bad. But ultimately, if you bring in concentrating solar power with storage, it drops that uh, curtailment of PV down considerably. So one thing adding concentrating solar power with thermal storage does is it allows you to get more photovoltaics onto the electric grid. Also, when you have concentrating solar power, it has a higher capacity credit. So this is the, the percent of the capacity that is considered firm by a utility. And you can see here, uh, these are two different scenarios for California, a 33% penetration and a 40% a 40 penetration. And you can look at photovoltaic is only given a capacity credit of 22% here and down to 3.4% here. But if you add CSP with storage, your capacity credit goes way up. That CSP has a capacity credit of 92 or 96%. 
And there's a value associated with that. The electricity from CSP is worth more than the electricity from photovoltaics. And you can see on this chart, it depends. Uh, uh, here, uh, there's a couple different examples. Again, a 33% penetration versus a 40%. But you can see here the, the value of CSP versus PV. So for example, $48 per megawatt hour, that's 4.8 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, greater value for CSP than PV in a 33% scenario. Now that's good, but as you'll see later, PV's gotten really cheap. And, and if, so if that difference in cost between CSP and PV, that value um, is not as large as the difference in cost between the two, then it's, it's not helping you enough. And the last thing I want to say is everything I've been talking about is kind of electric supply. We can also control the demand side. So in the US, I mentioned that uh, buildings are responsible for 45% of carbon emissions. Buildings use 75% of US electricity. Uh, and, and in most developed nations, buildings use a lot of electricity. And so now you've got this variable uh, source of electricity, wind and solar. What do you do about that? Well. Look at where all that electricity gets used. It gets used at buildings. Can you control when it uses that electricity? And so there's various things that you can do uh, uh, called demand response. Uh, and, and there's a, a system that's been developed at NREL called 4C. It just won an R&D 100 award just last week. Uh, and what that concept does is it monitors signals from the utility and adjusts things. So, if, for example, a utility sends out a load shedding event is going to be from 5 to 9 in the evening, you would pre-cool the building so you're not running in the air conditioner during that time. Uh, you would take all the electricity off the grid and off rooftop PV and fully charge your battery, home battery, so you discharge that during that peak period. Um, and then, of course, you would reschedule appliances in a smart way. The good news. There really is an enormous energy transition underway. You know, we, we went at the beginning of the 20th century, we went from the horse and, and buggy to the horseless carriage. In the, in the 21st century, we're going from central generation electricity to a combination of central uh, electric generation with local generation rooftop and, and also a community solar, uh, as well as electric, electric vehicles. That's a Chevy Bolt in that picture there. So how quickly can these transformations take place? How quickly are we going to transition to electric cars? There's a lot of debate about that, but I, I wanted to show one example here. This is a picture of Fifth Avenue in New York City. On the left side is 1900, on the right side is 1913. The left side, all horse-drawn carriages. On the right side, all automobiles. That was a 13-year period went over a complete transition in, in trans transportation. This is an example of what's happened to the costs uh, and deployment of renewable energy. Um, I know we have some people here from uh, IEA here. Uh, I, mean, I mean no disrespect. <laughs> but these are IEA uh, World Energy Outlook projections for PV growth in gigawatts in all the different years, 2006, 2000, et cetera, all the way up the line. Those are the predictions, the projections, and this is the actual growth of PV. Every year, it goes way beyond what's projected. And if you look at the uh, Energy Information Administration in Washington, D.C., they do just as bad a job of forecasting wind and solar as IEA does. Exponential growth of electricity. You can see wind, photovoltaics, and concentrating solar power. Now, remember, this is, this is a log curve. That's exponential. Um, so there's actually a lot more wind than PV. And at this point, uh, if PV hasn't passed wind yet, it's close to it. So the growth of photovoltaics is really amazing. These are costs, dramatic decreases in costs, all right? These are some recent bids to the Excel utility in Colorado for wind and solar with battery storage, two to four cents a kilowatt hour, the lowest cost. So bids for new generation from wind and solar are beating out gas. That's pretty amazing. China is doing an awful lot in renewables, uh, as you probably know. If you look at uh, who's investing in renewable energy, these are Chinese investments, $1.9 billion, uh, Europe, the US, Asia, uh, Oceania. How do you pronounce that? Oce Oceania, I don't know. Beats me. Anyway, um, 
China is really investing a lot in renewable energy. Uh, so uh, President Macron uh, met with Prime Minister Modi in India and, and agreed to uh, invest money into the Solar Alliance. Uh, India is very aggressive now. Of course, often I give a presentation on climate change. I talk about the great things China is doing, and somebody raised their hand and said, yeah, but what about India? India uses a lot of coal, but they're actually becoming very progressive and very, very aggressive now in addressing renewables. This is a study that NREL did for 160 gigawatts of renewable energy deployed in India. All right, back to the sobering news. I like this writer, David Roberts for Vox on the internet. He says, there's a revolution in clean energy, but it's not happening fast enough. Often what we do in the renewable energy industry, if we look, uh, and this is billions of tons of oil equivalent, that's the energy unit here, but we look at this exponential growth of renewables and we go, this is great, we're doing great. The problem is coal has peaked out, but oil is still going up and gas is still going up, and these are actually swapping out what we've done in renewables. That's why we're not addressing climate change. If you look at um, the path we need to be on for greenhouse gas, gas emissions, um, these are the pledges. If you look at the pledges from Paris, if we met those pledges, we'd be in the about 2.6 to 3.2 degrees Celsius increase compared to pre-industrial. It's not really close to that two degrees and people are not meeting the pledges. These are the pathways for two degrees, one and a half degrees is even further down. So that's the sobering news. We need to do much, much better. And as the previous speaker pointed out, Reducing carbon emissions is no longer enough. We need to get carbon out of the atmosphere. We can't just stop emitting it. We got too much in there. And so if you look at these various paths to get us to two degrees C, somewhere between mid-century and 2100, they all drop below zero. So here we're actually extracting CO2 from the atmosphere. And how do we do that? Uh, afforestation, you know, new forests, stop deforestation, better soil stewardship, it was mentioned Beck's uh, bioenergy with carbon, uh, carbon capture and storage. Plants suck atmosphere, uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. If we use that energy, but then take that carbon and put it into the ground, uh, then it becomes net carbon negative. Uh, IPCC has bet a lot on Beck's, uh, but there's a lot of uh, debate about it. Uh, and then finally, direct air capture. Uh, when you consider air as four hundredths of one percent, uh, yeah. You Wrap up. Yeah. When you consider uh, carbon dioxide as four hundredths of one percent of the air in the atmosphere, you got to move a lot of air to get CO2 out of the atmosphere. That's a lot of fan power, a lot of surface area. But I think we have to look at every possible technique that we can. Um, my email is down there, and I'll, I'm going to finish with a plug. This is a textbook we just came out. A lot of the figures that I showed you are in this textbook, and uh, I think it's got a good chapter on concentrating solar power and how to use the system advisor model to model CSP systems. Um, and that's it. Thanks. A couple of minutes to entertain one or two questions. Yes. A question there. Uh, Jeff Compson, uh, RWTH, Aachen University in Germany. Um, I'm just interested about the um, the diagram you have of that shows the, the effects of or the benefits of CSP in terms of reducing PV curtailment. Yes. Um, and I was I was thinking if you have a fi if you already have a fixed um, in, uh, amount of PV installed, um, I was wondering. I think it, it might it wasn't that clear from the plot. How installing new CSP would reduce the PV curtailment for for an existing amount of PV? Yeah. Um, you know, there are just basically the storage of the CSP allows you to shift things around. Okay. So there are there are times when uh, you have uh, you know too much uh, PV, um, and and times that are, it would be curtailed that you can use it because you're you're using. How do I explain this? <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess, what's that? You can oversize the CSP plant size yeah. in order to take into account the 
excess of energy, but this is, has to be planned before the actual system will be installed. Yeah. So uh, we have a similar situation now. We are modeling uh, here in the Cyprus grid. Yes. Uh, so what uh, one requirement that we have uh, set to the CSP project yeah. is to have instead of 50 megawatt, it can be 25 megawatt, 24 hours. Yeah. So in this way, you make uh, the CSP plan more dispatchable. And uh, in that sense, um, if you need this 25 megawatt, it acts basically as a pure storage system, the rest of the plant, and uh, they can get capacity credit, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you, you, know, if you have a CSP plant on the grid, there are times when um, if the CSP were running, that you'd cut back on the CSP electricity production and, and, and run that PV. And now your CSP would be charging stores and so shifting the load. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think, oh, I think well, what also makes sense um, in that situation is um, if you have uh, a lot of PV and you're seeing a lot of curtailment already, and then you install um, enough CSP such that the dispatchability means that you can basically substitute baseload generation, it, it could potentially lead to a scenario where you can start to shut down baseload power plants and then the curtailment of the PV during the day is not so, would not happen yes. to, uh, to such yeah. an extent. Sorry, but I think I'm yeah. oh. going to do the curtailment of the PV. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, All right. Because we don't have the time for it. I mean, this is a very important point, but it's not to be solved in 30 seconds. So well, and also I think there's a panel on this later. Yes. So we can discuss it during the panel. All right, let's thank you, uh, Chuck, again.